Hello everyone, and welcome to a new Let's Play of Caveman to Cosmos, a complete overhaul mod for Civilization 4. Now while I have played all Civilization games, Caveman to Cosmos is, barring an outlier of Alpha Centauri, in my opinion, the best experience you can get from this franchise. This mod brings a level of detail that is impossible to achieve anywhere else with any other game that I'm aware of, and while Civilization 5 and 6 brings a lot of nice ideas and polished graphics, they never come even close in their complexity to this masterpiece. This is only emphasized by the fact that it has been in active development since November of 2010 and is currently on version 41.2. So how can I summarize what Caveman to Cosmos is for the people who are unfamiliar with it? Well. Game into Cosmos adds over 700 further technologies to the game, introduces new eras, hundreds of units, it overhauls diplomacy, religion, combat, barbarians, and culture spread. It introduces new mechanics as education, crime, tourism, dwellings, and sickness. It just makes everything so much better for those that want depth and challenge of running a civilization. Not to mention, the technologies you gain throughout your playthrough puts the evolution of human civilization into a real perspective and allows you to educate yourself on many of the historical aspects and events. Now, many of you will know that about 4 years ago I already did a let's play of this mod, a fairly long one, but in the end I ran into several issues. The first one was on my side and it came down to the performance of my aging computer. There simply was too much happening on the screen for a 2014 processor to handle. Second thing was the performance of the game itself, which has been vastly improved in the past few years. And third was the playstyle I chose for the game. Now while I was recording this in a semi-update style where I played for a bit, jumped forward and then played again, the emphasis was on continuity and regularity. Instead, what I think I would do in this let's play will be more leaning to an AAR style of the game. Meaning, I will cut out all the boring, tedious parts that I will enjoy privately in my living room with my hot tea as a companion, and do just regular updates on the state of the civilization, hopefully packing way more content into an episode than I did previously. However, this leads to the downside of it being an irregular let's play. There will probably be fairly regular updates in the beginning, as I will be pre-recording most of it, but later on it will probably slow down to 2 or 3 episodes per week depending on the time on my side. But don't worry, I plan to cover everything important and add a lot of explanation for the steps I plan to take in the future. Now, let's speak setup of the game. I will be playing a custom scenario made for me by Sangscaly, a friend of mine from Discord, and I have to say he has my biggest gratitude. He started working on the scenario with me over two years ago and he stuck with it patiently until today, updating it and making it better while I postponed the Let's Play several times. Now, I have to say that I have never seen the entire map with resources and civilization positioning, but I know of the general shape and idea behind it. Sangscape so put a lot of love into making it so that each civilization is put in a slightly different environment and having their own specific advantages and resources. Theoretically, it should lead to a very interesting playthrough that should put emphasis on trade and make the dominance of one civilization impossible, at least in the beginning, as nobody should have everything. If you want to try the scenario yourself, the link is in the description, so you can download it and enjoy it. So how are the game rules set up for this map then? Well, since I'm properly crazy, I will be playing as Byzantine tribe on eternity speed with upscaled research time and production time and with 24 other civilizations. I will start on noble difficulty, but every 100 turns it will increase automatically by 1 until it is at the highest difficulty. This way I won't fall behind in the very beginning where it is the easiest, but I will still be able to enjoy the challenge I am looking for. The game will require complete kills, meaning all cities and units need to be destroyed before a civilization is out of the game. We will have realistic culture spread of our cities, city flipping is on, and all cities will start with one tile of border only. We have happiness penalties from overextension on, barbarian world is on, and barbarian and neanderthal cities too. Inquisition is on, 
meaning we can fight proper religious wars. There will be no tech brokering, but technologies can still be traded if you research them yourself. And tech diffusion is on as well. So no civilization in the Dark Ages while we roll over them in tanks. Plus, the Beeline Stings rule is on as well, meaning you cannot just rush forward in a new era because you will be punished. We have the new combat rules turned on, including realistic siege, advanced routes and developing leaders with random AI personalities. Wow, that took a bit, but with the magic of modern editing software, I would like to welcome you again and let's jump into the game. Welcome everyone to the game map. Now right off the bat I can start by saying that this is a great spot, I'm very happy with what uh, location Byzantium is starting in, though I'm pretty sure that Sang Scaly made all of the starting locations as beneficial as this one, though probably each in its own right. Now if we investigate the map a bit, we can see that we are starting near a river that has a lot of, uh, what is it called, flood points? Yes, flood points, which will give us a boost to food production. Uh, we have some lush areas here, we have some forests, a bit of hills uh, to boost our mining production once we learn about mining. We have some bamboo here even, and we have some swamps. But what I'm really happy about is the caves here. Now, as you probably know, uh, prehistorical humans dwelled in caves which, provide them, which provided them with protection, uh, against weather and animals and this translates into the game pretty well. Hell, I think one of the starting technologies is even called cave dwelling. Uh, we're starting with two units. We have an ancestral band which is our first city founding unit and a stone thrower. Now I'm gonna get to the stone thrower soon but let's start with founding our city. You can see that the tile that we're standing at has four food production and two gold which will translate nicely into a boost in research and I don't see any better spot where we could start. Now, there's probably a ton of things that we cannot see here, uh, special resources and like, but those will be revealed once we get appropriate technologies. So let's start our first city called Constantinople here. And you can see that right off the bat we can start with Brutes, Alpha Female, Alpha Male and Stone Thrower. Now what is Alpha Female and what is Alpha Male? I will explain very soon, but let's start by examining the city. Now, I want to point out a couple of things that are different as a base mechanic from other Civilization games. Now, every other Civilization games basically works like this. You get some resources from your city, but most of it from the surrounding tiles. Now, Caveman to Cosmos flips this on its head, meaning that you get a lot of resources from the surrounding tiles, but you get way more from the city itself, meaning there is a lot of room for specialization, special pops working in your city, and you can build pretty heavily industrialized areas with cities quite close to each other if you have the time and resources to battle the penalties for overextension. So what I mean by this is Right now we can only build two buildings, we can build an alpha female and an alpha male, but you can see that each one of these gives us a boost. Alpha female gives us additional food production, while alpha male gives us a boost to production. And each of them reduces something. Alpha female reduces um, sickness in our dwelling and alpha male reduces criminality in our dwelling. Now I'm gonna start by uh, building the alpha male and I'm gonna explain why. As I mentioned most of the production in the beginning comes from your city and it will take quite a lot of time to get the ball rolling on growth. You can see that we need unbelievable... what was it? 4000 something? Wait, was the tab? 4389 food stored to jump to population 2. Right now we got 50 people and I think we're gonna bump it up to about 100 once we get 
all of this food. Now it might really seem like a huge thing, but if you look at the technology advisor, you can see there is a lot of technologies here for us to work with. Now they split the technology tree to prehistoric era, uh, then you research the sedentary lifestyle and you get to, I guess it would be pre-classical era, then you get to the classical lifestyle, a medieval lifestyle, then there's renaissance, then industrial lifestyle, atomic lifestyle, which is the atomic age, then there's the informational lifestyle, which is the modern age, and then you get to the future. Nanotech lifestyle, transhuman lifestyle, galactic lifestyle, cosmic lifestyle, and transcendent lifestyle. Now, I think I made it as far as renaissance in the game. So let's see how far we're gonna get during this playthrough. There's a number of technologies here and why I mentioned the production thing is that, for example, if we get scavenging, you can see that we get a, an ant catcher that we can build, which gives us extra food. We can build a grasshopper catcher, which will give us extra food. We can get a carrion gatherer, which will give us extra food, but he will also give us extra sickness. Uh, actually, this is not sickness, this is unhealthiness. Uh, but that is removed once we learn cooking. We can get earthworm gatherer, we can get snail gatherer, and all of these give you boost to production in your city. If we get gathering, we get berry gatherers, driftwood gatherer, and so on and so on. Production seems to be the key here so that your city can always build the newest things and produce as much food as possible. Or, in the other hand, if you focus on food, you will grow faster, but it will take longer to build things. So that's why I always start with production and then translate that into food. So uh, that's the logic behind it. Now, uh, we have a lot of technologies ahead of us in this uh, prehistorical age. So what I'm going to start with here is I'm going to start with cave dwelling especially because we have the caves. Now this will give us plus one health in all our cities and we can build one of these wonders which is, well there's a lot of them and as you can see they will give us extra production of free, extra food of free and extra uh, gold of free. But we will automatically build cave dwelling this building is automatically built by our citizens when its requirements are met. And that means once we have caves near our city vicinity, this will immediately pop up. Now there are other shelters or buildings that you can have your people stay in. Like here, shelter building will give you housing grass huts, which requires very tall grass. There's housing igloos, housing lean-tos. So depending on where your city is, your people will immediately build one of these as their main dwelling and this of course improves or I, I guess it improves eventually as we get for example sedentary lifestyle should give us something like like something better <laughs> and I am not sure where it is anyway uh, one also important point that I would like to make is the fact that things get obsolete. For example, if we get the scavenging and we get, for example, the let's go with the carrion gatherer, uh, it obsoletes with replacement organs and it's turned into industrial farms or the nest thief is obsolete with antibiotics. So you upgrade your buildings as you go around and obsolete some of them because they are no longer suitable with the uh, civilization. Like termite catcher is obsolete with city planning because you know this building no longer makes sense in a modern world. So one should always think about this when building their cities that they will eventually turn. And I really like this mechanic of obsoleting quite a lot of your older buildings and making them into new, better buildings. Okay, so what do we want for technology? So as I mentioned, we're going to start with the cave dwelling. Uh, I'm going to go with nomadism next because that's going to give us a wanderer, which is a very nice scouting unit. And then we're going to go with scavenging because I mentioned that this gives us a lot of extra things. So we might actually start with gathering first for the reasons that are obvious. It gives us buildings that uh, bump up our production and some that bump our food 
Well, this should give on. Yeah, this this is focused on food only. So let's go for cave dwelling, then nomadism, then gathering, scavenging, and then we're gonna go with language. And language will give us a boost to culture. Now, what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna advance one turn. Uh, we're gonna keep the tribal guardian in the city, and I'm gonna show you one more mechanic before I do my first skip into the future. Now this mechanic are the additional stats each city has. Apart from uh, the food production and the regular production or you know industrial production, whatever you want to call it, the hammers, you get additional stats here. You get crime, you get disease, you get water pollution and air pollution. Now each one of these translates into uh, certain malices in your cities. You can see that we have an actual level and an increase or decrease per turn. Now we are pretty okay until it gets to couple hundred but once you have those they will start negatively affecting your happiness and health. Crime of course decreases uh, health and I believe at higher levels it can take away part of your gold production. Disease increases unhealthiness in your city and is thus very dangerous. But you know, you can battle disease pretty easily by building sanitation, uh, keeping healers in the city and so on and so on. Water pollution and air pollution, I don't think these are actually... I forget be the word, like battleable, or you, you, you cannot battle these uh, in the very beginning and they will gradually grow, making your cities less and less desirable to live until one of the modern eras where you can start lowering the water pollution and air pollution making your people a bit happier. So we need to keep this in mind. Apart from these, there should be also, but I don't see it triggered here yet, education, which will come probably with oral tradition, meaning uh, your citizens can get ed education and the better the education, the higher the research boost uh, from the city. And I believe there's a, also other ones but I can't recall them. We will see them pop up as we as we go ahead. So um, I think that is uh, all for now and what am I gonna do in the upcoming turns? Well I'll be back once we get the cave dwelling and I'm gonna scout around the area. We're gonna build the alpha males uh, then oh not alpha males but alpha male then we're gonna build the alpha female to get extra bonus to food production and the better health of our citizens and then I'm gonna start producing stone throwers and you know sending them out to scout the area. Now there is a mechanism that I haven't mentioned yet which is hunting animals. Uh, there is a lot of wildlife going around and there will be more and more of it as we progress through the game. Uh, these are considered sort of barbaric but they don't attack you unless they have very high um, very high power to your balance. Basically if they have a, for example strength of 6 and you have 1 they will attack you like a tiger would or something like that. But stone throwers have a natural uh, bonus against them I think. Yeah, they got... where is it? 25% against animals, okay. They also get a bonus against melee and archers and they got extra city defense and hill defense. And I think they got first strike, yeah. They got, oh, zero to two first strike. So, you know, they have a bit of um, a bit of a bonus, but they are very, very weak if they're used to attack, especially barbarians. But if you hunt and kill an animal, you can see there's a lot of them here, a lot of types. You will get extra food and production into your city. You can even tame some animals and bring them back, creating totems or uh, legends about the animals, uh, reminiscent to the um, you know prehistorical tales. You can do some cave paintings and stuff like that. It's pretty cool. So hopefully we can maybe find some animals and kill them, which will boost our um, our food production and our melee, produc uh, melee production, uh, our industrial production, and thus we will be able to boost our growth. Because eventually, uh, this amount of hunting can even, well, eventually, I mean, in the beginning parts of the game, in the prehistoric age, you can get more food from hunting at certain point than you get from your city. 
but once you get to sedentary lifestyle start uh, you know you start farming producing things like uh pig styes and stuff like that you will you know pretty much out of date completely uh the hunting style and start producing units that are mainly uh, focused on military and uh, trade but you know we'll see anyway i'll be back with an update right now welcome back the year is 194,321 BC and as you can see we've discovered a nice chunk of the map. Now our original Stoneforge unit has discovered two well, neutral civilizations at this point. Arabians in the north, here's the city of Mecca and Iraqis south of them with the city of Onondaga. Now our Stonethrower has the first upgrade combat one because we actually lucked out and when we discovered this hill a Neanderthal brute attacked them but as they were on the hill and were pretty good with the first strikes they survived and even got a promotion for that. So now they have extra strength, uh, they are less likely to subdue animal but have a higher chance to a hunting kill which is pretty good what happened also is that i believe here was a village and it gave us nomadism so we now have the technology that we needed to get scavenging and gathering nomadism uh, actually uh, allows us to get wanderer and neanderthal wanderer for those that have neanderthal culture and wanderer is actually a pretty good unit it's um i see it as an upgrade of the stone thrower it has a hundred percent bonus against wild animals can withdraw from combat uh, when it's losing there's a 10 percent chance i believe this is per turn and has a speed of two which is great for early um, early scouting and early animal hunting. So I already have uh, one of them built and that unit is here and I wanted to show you this is exactly the village that I have been talking about. Uh, I think we only discovered one now that I'm thinking I'm hoping I'm not blanking this should be the second one so I wanted to show you how this works. You send your unit in it and get a random event. One just principle from the depths of a cave is more powerful than an army. Okay, so we lucked out twice. The first one gave us nomadism, and these guys gave us 166 research towards cave dwelling. So, nice. Nice, we're starting pretty good. Plus one health in all cities. Enable city garrison trait uh, when your cities uh, get attacked, or your you know units get attacked, they can get the city garrison, which I believe gives 20% city defense, which is pretty nice trait. And once we get this technology, we should get uh, the buildings built in our, uh, or the cave dwelling building built in our capital, our uh, only city. I like to say that it's a capital, but it's just the major city, <laughs> the only city that we have. Okay, now we can go with gathering, uh, as we announced before. That will give us a gatherer and flint, flint gatherer, berry gatherer. Driftwood gatherer, grain gatherer, grass gatherer, lava gatherer, lichen gatherer, and lumber gatherer. But you know, the, these are dependent on the surroundings of your city. So you cannot get, mm, oh, you can get always berry and driftwood gatherer. But you cannot, for example, get lava rock gatherer because it requires an active volcano. So we don't have that anywhere near us. So that's gonna take a while. It's gonna take 41 turns to get it. But pretty lucky start if I see so myself. Now I believe these things are uh, based on random RNG and we are doing pretty well. So we're producing a second wanderer in the city but once we are going to be done with that we are going to switch to one of these wonders. Uh, we need one of them. I'm not really sure which one I'm gonna go with. Um, I guess this is a bit of a Sophie's choice. All of them are the same, but any of them could be built by an opposing civilization. So I guess I, I think I might just go with with Blombos Caves because we get caves, so let's get Blombos Caves. So uh, that's what I wanted to mention for now, and let's just end the turn and see if they built the cave dwelling. Yep. 
Oh, we also built the animal burrows and cave dwelling and tree hollow. Nice. So they got more buildings here and our, our current production is seven. And we are no longer... No, actually we are a bit unhealthy. You can see that our crime has went up to 33, but it's no longer rising. This is the balance uh, that we are at right now. Disease is at 31, no negative effect. Water potion is at minus 70 and air potion at minus 101 because we're not producing any pollutants at this point. But that is gonna change very soon, especially if we start building things like uh, fire and, I don't know, meat processing plant and stuff like that. I don't know what the original one is called. There, There is a one here somewhere that... Yeah, I believe this one. Yeah, fire pit. You can see that. Oh, that increases actual fire risk, not air pollution, but fire risk. But there are things that will increase pollution pretty, pretty soon. Though I do not see them here, and I don't think it's worth looking at them right now. So you can continue scouting, and so can you. And I'll be back with another update. Either when we get gathering or when something else happens that's going to be considered interesting. So, we just had a random event that gave us 23 extra research towards gathering and that gave it to us. So, we discovered the technology of gathering in the year 189,409 BC. The gathering gives us uh, two different possibilities in gatherers there's not a big difference between them for us and we're gonna have access to one anyway but a number of buildings will be now available to us that i'm gonna pursue i think even the storage pit should be able um, or should be available for us in the village now so let's check it out um, but first we need to see what kind of technology we're gonna go with next. Now I'm tempted to go with scavenging but I think we're gonna go with uh, language because language gives us extra possibilities on... yes, it gives us community discussion and as you can see that with a book there, plus one turn, it will give us education which will boost our research plus it gives health and culture and we need culture to expand the borders of our village. I don't think there's anything else here that will be exactly useful for us, but that should be still fine. It's gonna take 51 turns to get it. Now as you can see we have killed a pigeon and that confirms the fact that we started hunting. Uh, we have five food gathered already and we gathered a couple of um, couple of extra for uh, the building as well. I think like six points. And when we look at the building tab, there is a number of things that we can now pursue. We could go for the berry gatherer, we could go with the grain gatherer, grass gatherer, lichen gatherer, lumber gatherer, reed gatherer, because we got reeds in the vicinity of our uh, town, a rock gatherer, stick gatherer, tuber gatherer, and storage pit. So, as I mentioned before, we're gonna finish the Bombos Caves. And then I'm probably gonna start. I'm gonna start with the reed gatherer because that gives both um, boost to production and to food, which will start us on our way to increasing our population. Then we will go probably with lichen gatherer so that we don't get extra unhealthiness because we're still balancing it. And most of this unhealthiness is actually from the difficulty. So as the game will bump the difficulty up, this is going to keep increasing. So we need to battle it uh, from now. Then we might go with, I guess, rock gatherer. Then stick gatherer and then we're going to start with the tubers and grain and stuff like that to boost our food production as well. By the time though language will be available for us so it's going to be a bit more uh, to choose from. Though I think that extra... no that... Uh, okay that culture boost comes from oral discussion. I think we're getting some culture... no we're not getting any at this point. Uh, one from building base... Okay, no, we're getting about half a point of culture per turn. We're definitely not going to need it anytime soon, but yeah, it, it is there. So that is something that we should keep in mind. 
Okay, there's a pair of ducks here. I'm gonna avoid them and just... Oh, I can see some bananas there. Uh, what I wanted to mention before I end the episode is though that we were pretty lucky with the stone throwers. Uh, I got an additional one from a village somewhere around here. I think it was maybe here or here. And that actually gave us an additional stone thrower. And both of these are now at combat too. Uh, one of them from hunting, I think this one. And the other one entered a village and the villagers were hostile. So they attacked the hunter and it survived with like point one health, but enough experience to get combat too. So our uh, stone throwers are now much stronger against animals, which makes them pretty much uh, killers if they can find the animals and <laughs> you know actually attack them because they keep running away from us and that's not that good. Now, okay, we could use you, but I don't think we can because um, none of these tiles are ours. So let's keep the gatherer in the village. And I just wanted to mention that I got a message like 50 turns ago that uh, a gatherer was produced somewhere else. So yeah, we are already falling behind as far as technology goes for other uh, for other civilizations, but maybe you know they they went for gathering first and they ignored cave-dwelling. I would like to believe that, but I think that the game is giving uh, the AI, of course, a lot of advantages. Bunch of loon. <laughs> okay, Not sure what that is, but I'm just you know I'm just looking around here. These bananas. These bananas give quite a lot of production, uh, I have to say. And if you build buildings on those, you can get a banana plantation, and that is a gold mine for you. Plus, they give extra health, so yeah, I like that. Okay, we're gonna finish searching here, and then I'm gonna send the units to patrol in the central area, just hunting animals, and the wanderers are gonna continue uh, going south searching for. Now, what is this? Obsidian. Oh damn, that would be good, but it's too far away. There's some lemons here too. We haven't discovered really anything around us, right? Oh, we discovered wheat! Okay, so we got wheat. I guess we got that from gathering. What is this? Mushrooms. Okay. So wheat and mushrooms. I was thinking about where we could found our... Ah, uh, there's apples here. Nice. Nice, nice. Where we could find, uh, found our second city, Indigo. Mm. And I was thinking either here or here, and the third city could be built here at, uh, you know, the uh, location of the spring. So we would be, uh, you know, naturally or organically settling along this river. But considering that we got the indigo here, I think I might just go ahead and put the city here. It's going to be quite close to the other one, but as I mentioned, that doesn't really matter because most of the production comes from the city. And we can grow uh, pretty, pretty slowly anyway, so it's not going to be an issue. Getting some apples and coca here. Okay, so the third city could be here, and giving us access to coca and apples. And then maybe the fourth one could be maybe here somewhere, giving us access to more apples and uh, resin. Uh, there's coconut here, so fifth city could be somewhere around here. But I don't see anything... Is there anything here? No, that's just... We don't have um, any mineral. There's olives here. Uh, but nothing really that valuable. I think I'm gonna turn on... Where is it? Resource display. That's gonna give us a bit more idea there's some tea okay pumpkins okay resin is here there's some prime timber okay I think that one would help us but they yeah, are the closest stone or marble or something for production is all the way here and that's too far I'm not willing to well maybe if we build the city here then the next one could be here maybe but still that's a bit of stretch okay first city here second city here and maybe third here we're gonna see anyway i think this is enough for the first episode i hope you enjoyed it uh we have laid the grounds to our civilization we're actually leading the leaderboard at this point but believe me that is going to wait no 
represent you in Babylon. Okay, never mind. We're not reading anything. We're just average. But I'm happy with uh, the development that we've done. And if we can do the Bombos Caves, uh, we are going to be golden because that's going to jumpstart our production massively. And hopefully the growth and the production and everything should set us, you know, on our way to becoming, well, not a dominant civilization, but someone that can compete with the others. So, thank you very much, and I'll see you in the next episode of Let's Play Caveman to Cosmos. Cosmos. Caveman to Cosmos. God damn it. What a way to end the episode. Caveman to Cosmos with me, Alpha Bionega.